Hello everyone and welcome back to Animation Pilgrimage where we watch every single theatrically released animated film in chronological order. I'm Sean. And I'm Tanil. And today we are watching the 1962 film The Bath from USSR. The Bath House. The Bath House? It's referred to as both. Or just Bath. Go take a bath. I don't know. Uh, that's one thing I was wa uh, I was randomly thinking about when we watched this movie is uh, the subtitles like this movie is called Bath, and I'm like, cool. That just makes me think about the fact that uh, just like it must be something in their language, the connotations. They don't need a defining word like the in front of it. In front of it, because pretty much all of the Russian films we've watched so far have been like the bath, the uh, swan princess, the swan princess, the humpbacked horse, or and the wild swans, or whatever. Whatever, they all ha most of them have the at the beginning or the letter, and I'm wondering if a lot of them in original Russian don't have any sort of the at the beginning. It's just something about the way their language is constructed. They don't need that word there. It is perfectly acceptable just to say bath. I don't know, maybe. Who knows? I don't know. It's not just... us! <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Obviously not us, but I don't know. It just seems like it was it, 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 it was neat. Okay. It was a neat thing. So, you want to talk about this film? Because I have a feeling I'm going to be doing most of the talking this episode. So, I want to offer you a chance to do some talking before I begin my tirade. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, yeah. So, this movie, mm -hmm. as far as I can tell, is some sort of parody of the government and, you know, communi communism is good and stuff, as per usual. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a stop-motion film. And, okay, I guess just to get into plot... Uh, yeah. We have a couple of young inventor guys that want to patent a time machine. Mm hmm And the government facility or whatever that they're trying to get it through is like, nah, come back later. We'll, we'll worry about it later and yada, yada, yada. Right. They keep getting pushed to the side. And eventually it gets denied later in the movie, just showing that, like, government systems are garbage and stuff like that. Mm hmm So they make it anyways... Additionally, there is a British guy here that has a uh, translator, and he's just kind of like this weird doddering fool, and he finds out about the time machine, and he's willing to throw lots of money at it, and also maybe steal their invention and take it back to their country and stuff. I'm not really sure uh -huh. what was going on here, but the machine gets funded, I think. There's, I think. Uh, there's also an artist guy that exists. Uh-huh. And there's the government official who's in charge of everything, and he sounds like a crazy man. Uh-huh. But also setting all... Like, it's obvious that they're parodying something through a lot of these characters, but I personally don't... Understand Understand any or know any of what they're parodying. Uh -huh. But they're very clearly making fun of a lot of these people because they're set up to spout stupid and silly and ridiculous demands and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle of the movie, the movie stops. The creator comes out and says, oh, no, the government guy wants to watch our film and make sure it's OK. So yeah. then all of the people that they're making fun of that are essentially everybody that is in control of the working class. Mm hmm. Um, come and sit down and watch the movie and like what are you saying here you like making fun of my whatever and he's like no sir of course we're doing this and stuff he's like oh, I don't like that you're gonna have to change this this and this and this and I'm like okay I get this parody because we've watched enough of these movies that yeah. we know that the government was heavily involved with censoring a lot of movies and saying you can't have these messages you have to change these things uh -huh. and stuff like that so i got that part of it yeah yeah that part was very clear to me as well i feel like 
on a general whole, I followed this movie a little bit better than you did. Okay. Maybe, but also after the movie was done, I had a very long conversation um, with Redway 2, who provided us with this movie. Thank you yet again for giving us another Russian film we otherwise would not have gotten a hold of. Mm -hmm. And also giving us the ludicrous amounts of information that I'm sure you're going to dump on me. And yeah. the audience. Yeah. Can you tell me how this movie ends? Well, I'm not done. I'm not even there okay, yet. Okay, okay. Continue. Continue. I'm not even there yet. So, the time machine works, and a woman from the year 2030? 2030. 2030. 2030. So, you know, 11 years from now, <laughs> at the time of recording. Yeah. Um, is like, oh, yes, I'm from the far flung future of good communism. And uh, we're going to take everyone on the time machine to the future. And she has a stipulation. Do you remember what the stipulation uh, the is? Stipulation is something along the lines of be a good communist. Yeah. Essentially. Uh huh. So the work you have to have something to offer, like like you have to have some kind of good virtue or whatever. Okay. So all of the working class obviously gets in and the people that make the time machine get in, and the artist and the government official, and like there's these other simpering sods that like are also part of their crew mm -hmm. and stuff, all technically get in, but then during the time travel forward sequence, they all get thrown into the trash, mm -hmm. which the creator of the movie then pulls them out of the trash and locks them up, and the government official's like, hey, are you saying there's no room for us in good communism? And the dude's like, looks at the camera and just smiles, and then, the end. Yeah. Obviously, yeah, it's very clear that they don't like these specific people and think that they are bad for good communism. Mm-hmm. It's very clear that that's what this whole movie's about. The movie says it multiple times. Yeah. And all the good people go to the year 2030, where good communism will be in place. Mm -hmm. Not just communism, it's more so about, like, socialism. Okay. Well, because I it's mean, more about the working class and that kind of thing. I mean, socialism is a... Part of... Is, is a facet, or is related to communism. Mm-hmm. But more people, at least nowadays, are much more open to the idea of socialism mm -hmm. compared yeah. to communism because whatever. Yeah. All right. So that's the summary. Are you ready for details? Sure. I mean, I just want to say it'll be interesting to see in 11 years if we have socialism utopia or com <laughs> communist utopia just like, like as, in the movie as a real person like huh i wonder if that will actually exist no in i'm not years we'll be dead we'll yeah, all be dead yeah the world will boiled away oh boy all right so anyway the bath so this is originally based on a play that was written in like the 1920s about uh, I'm sorry if I get my years a little mixed up here, but it was written about five years into Stalin's rule of Russia. Okay. That Fo means nothing. Follow with me here, okay? Stalin's the bad guy. Stalin's the bad guy? I mean, He's not the of the movie, but... but. Okay, he was the ruler that initiated... I'm going to go out on a limb here that's probably completely wrong. Mm -hmm. He's the first communist leader that they had, right? Let's see, now you're asking me questions that I'm not a thousand percent okay. answering. But if you're saying Stalin's a bad guy, there's a very good chance that he was dethroned and someone else was put in his place No, I that. feel No, I think Stalin was the one who overthrew... Someone else? Yeah. Well... I know we had the royals in place at some point, and yeah. then communism took over, and one of the guys that was in charge of communism for a while was Stalin. Uh-huh. But I think he came later. Okay. I'm so sorry, all of our Russian viewers. I'm so sorry as well. Like, I should know. Like, I have a general idea of how it goes down, but, like, I can't put names to, to what exactly happened, you know? Okay. All right. So, anyway... 
And okay, I'm just gonna head this off right now. Uh huh. Feel free to hit, let us know the real history of what we're bumbling over here. Yeah. But also, you guys have to realize we're doing we're doing a new episode of this every single week. So we don't necessarily have the time to go out and learn all of the history of a given country. Like to give us context. To give for us context one movie. for every single movie. We're more focused on the movies themselves than like all of the historical stuff around it. That's useful information to know, mm -hmm. but we don't have the time to do all of this ludicrous amount of information. So if you're yelling at us for being dumbasses... You're completely justified, you're, but also you're justified, we just don't have time. <laughs> but you gotta realize we just don't have the time to get further into it. Yeah. Anyway, though, this is based on a play. Yes. Written by someone we've already seen writing for, the playwright, um, Maya Mayakovsky, who wrote, like, the, the robot's poem in The Key, and wrote, oh, okay. um, wrote one of our, our other Russian films we watched, I think maybe Mystery Buff, I, I think mean, was the other one. Okay, well, that will be coming in the future if you're watching this in chronological order. Right. And then this wasn't adapted as a film until the 60s, but the play itself has quite the interesting history because it was just, wow, like, okay. This play, like, really, really makes fun of the government, like... To a point where how did this exist? Or like, how is yeah, this allowed to yeah, run? Type I'm, of mm -hmm. mm, in a in a very controlling government sense of a right. And even the original, like, okay, it originally got written and then got reviewed, and within the members of this person's party, it was reviewed very highly. Of course. <laughs> yeah, people really liked it, but then it went to censorship. Yeah. Before it went into production. Uh huh. And a lot changed, and a lot was, like, not okay. And it was also one of those plays that constantly changed, like, every single time it was performed. Oh, to make fun of the new thing that happened. Um, I think it was just more so, like, how this writer went about doing things. Like, like they liked a changing, ever-growing kind of okay. thing. Nothing was ever really set in stone. Well, that's neat. This play aired... And it was a bomb. Like, people didn't laugh. People didn't react. It was stone cold silence in the theater. <gasps> oh. It played for like a year, half a year. And then this guy, this playwright, mysteriously committed suicide. Ah, yes, definitely committed suicide. I don't know. I don't know. I, like, I don't have... There's enough context here that that's like, oh, that's really weird and strange and oh, this is awful. But, Mysteriously yeah. commits suicide just immediately makes me think, oh, someone killed him and made it look like suicide. Probably the government. I mean, I don't know. But, like, some of these reviews, man. Okay. For this original play, I gotta... Okay. Critical reception. All three premiere performances of The Bathhouse in Leningrad and Moscow evoked stormy criticism in the Soviet press. According to... So sorry about mispronouncing these names. Uh, Krasnia Gazata, Gazata. I'm sure you're putting the names on screen so people know who you're... <laughs> the issue of bureaucratism in, in it was... Handled superficially and one-sidedly, the play's fantasies about being abstract and bloodless. The audience remained emotionally cold and were indifferently trying to follow the plot in whichever itself occasionally is muddled, wrote a reviewer. In his bid to expose this vice, Mayakovsky failed to provide the class analysis of bureaucratism. Bureaucratism is the thing that the movie's trying to make fun of. Okay. Bureaucracy, yeah. Mm-hmm. The People's House Drama Theater production by 
V. Uh, Lutis proved to be uninventive and only aggravated the author's fallacies. Markovsky portrays monstrous bureaucrats without pointing to the ways of dealing with them. Uh, someone complained on March 20th, 1930, concluding, In all honesty, the play turned out bad. Meyerhold had no business staging it. Newspapers are full of examples of bureaucratic monstrosities. And what Markovsky does is, with a serious face, reports without the cases of petty bureaucracy, the play is not serious enough for the times we live in. On April 10th, Markovsky attended the performance of The Bathhouse at the Meyerhold Theater. Critic Alexander Farlsky remembered, he stood looking morbid and smoked, leaning against the doorpost. To cheer him up, I started speaking about Pop Davovsky's article in Prava, which written by the culture department's chief written by the culture department's chief reflected the position of the newspaper thus probably putting an end to this anti-bathhouse campaign this mo or this play was so widely hated there was an entire anti-bathhouse campaign against it wow it doesn't it doesn't so he was trying to say that, like, this article would, you know, helpfully hope stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. To which um, Mavakoski said, it doesn't matter anymore, this is too late, he retorted. Four days later, Mayakovsky committed suicide. Goodness griefus. Mm-hmm. So then we get to the movie itself. Mm-hmm. How much later in time was this movie made? Well, um, this play was ongoing in the 30s. Okay. So this would be about 30 years later. Okay. All right. And, oh, geez. Okay. So I, I'm going to try to paraphrase a lot of what Redway told me. Mm -hmm. Um. So... It's the late 50s, and I, I don't know what this movement is, but uh, Khrushchev's thaw happens, and everyone tries to move away from the Stalin period. The media is a lot more freeish and relaxed. So... Less government control. A little less government control. There's a little bit more experimentation going around. The animation in the Brumberg sisters, who we've seen their animation before, mm -hmm. Um, start a trend of comedic sa satirical cartoons and uh, they make a short animated classic called Big Troubles about a dysfunctional Soviet family. Uh, this is considered pretty important but this gave inspiration to this but this one, this film, The Bath, is considered uh, more historically important than anything else. Most Russian animation history documents mention it, but won't tell you what it's about. Oh, interesting. Yeah. This was important. What's it about? Don't worry about it. It was a big flop with audience and critics. Uh, 1.2 million viewers and critics calling it anti-art. Because it's throwing the artist away too? Hold on. Uh, Redway says the Soviet media just weren't fans of any modern art. <laughs> okay. I mean, it was also very modern art, mm -hmm. the whole movie. Yeah. Um, but it was a big hit within the studio, with most artists being like, Whoa, you can totally put this stuff in a movie! Uh, the 60s were generally a time for liberation for animators um, from and an escape from... Uh, realism and rotoscope that they had been stuck with in the past for yeah. Russia. Yeah, I guess I can see that. This, like right here, this mm -hmm. is when a lot of their style changes. Yeah. This is this is the breaking point. Mm hmm. Good for them. I so guess. So now, even more interestingly, this movie was directed by Sergei uh, Yudkovich. Um, who was a very prominent director in the Lenin films, 
with such classics as stories about Lenin, Lenin in Poland, and Lenin in Paris. I've never heard of any of these. But okay, so he's very much like tied into the government. I could kind see of that. Guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he was a member of the Goss Kino. So he was a member of the censorship board for films. And he made this movie. And he directed this movie. Okay. Uh, the art director for it was Felix Lev Zabowski, who was an underground artist in the 50s. And one of the artistic initiators of uh, Kirchhoff's Thaw. Do note that modern art in the USSR was extremely illegal and not published. Really? Apparently. That's... Hmm. I'm just trying to think about the connotations of why. And he became uh, famous behind the mainstream media for his minimal book illustrations. And Redway even provided me with some pictures. And I'll show these on Animation Pilgrimage as well. Oh, it's pretty. Yeah, it is. I like that. I like that, too. That's a nice bird. Mm-hmm. So that was the art director for this movie, working with a very, very conservative, like, quote-unquote conservative, in-the-government kind of director. This is a weird mashup. Uh-huh. Um, and, and Redway has a comment here that I also am curious about, but they say that they're surprised that there was no behind the scenes stories because it sounds like it would have been pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds like it would have been really, really interesting. Redway also, bless their soul, helps explain some of the jokes that are going on in this film. And I'm going to help Sean by giving him some more context here. So, uh, some of the character designs when it comes to this movie are really clever and adding more ways to like poke fun at the the bureaucracy kind of characters. So we have the main um, government official kind of guy, the very stern looking character, mm -hmm. who is actually modeled to look like a drawer. Or like a desk drawer. A chest of drawers, yeah. Because, and it's supposed to symbolize, like, because of the bureaucracy in um, in Russia, there's a term for, like, putting things in, in the file shelf. Okay. So it's like something's getting put in there and, like, never addressed again. We have our top men working on it. Top Men. Uh, right. And then it, like, it goes, it get, puts in the drawer and then, like, never gets seen again. It goes away. Right. Uh, and then um, this other character design is based off of, like, a paperweight. Okay. So something that's, like, functionally pretty much useless and only, like, holds things down. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have, like, this guy who... He's, like, all wibbly and wobbly, and he's supposed to be symbolic of, like, people who are willing to, like, bend. Although, they'll change on a whim to please. appease you and please you. Yeah, yeah. Bend over backwards. Right, exactly. Okay. This very, like, the, the very happy, optimistic guy. Mm -hmm. He sits next to a tea kettle, which means he's, like, full of hot air. And apparently also in Russia, if you're someone who is known to drink tea on the job, that's essentially our equivalent of, like, people who always stand by the water cooler. Oh, so he doesn't really work. He doesn't really work. Okay. Yeah. And then, all right, and then this one, I'm yet again, I'm just going to read what Redway says. The artist character. Yes. We both had questions about this when we first watched the movie. Mm -hmm. It's like, there's obviously some kind of jab being poked at here, but mm -hmm. I have no idea what they're talking about. But Redway says, now the artist character. Oh boy, the artist character. This one needs history. The original revolution was heavily supported by all the Russian avant-garde modern artists. Mavakovsky was one of them, and the government really liked working with them. But as time went on, Stalin came to power, and a lot of the original supporters fell out of favor. Uh, 
started getting a lot of criticism and eventually got replaced by the social realism arts. Mr. So the joke about this guy is that a realistic artist is ironically distorting the reality even harder than any abstract artist. Okay. Because the, the movie claims that they are a painter of portraits, battle scenes, and... Uh, photographic realism. Photographic realism. But in the movie, this guy is still drawing in a very abstract style because the mainstream Soviet media was still anti-modern art, art, so... <laughs> so they gave them the art style that they don't like. Mm-hmm. Even though the rest of the movie is also in that style. Yeah. And so now we can see that, like, they're making fun of, like, a very specific kind of art movement. Okay. All right. All right. It's also interesting to note that this movie is actually supposed to be two hours long. Oh, we got half of that. Yeah, we got, like, a, like a 45, 50-minute movie mm -hmm. here. So... Redway says that the original is two hours, and this film is basically 40 minutes, so there's a lot of things cut. Um, there's a whole punchline of the streetcar monologue, where it's the like very bureaucratic guy talking to the working class. Mm -hmm. And his final line of, we will ride with all Sylvian convenience, conveniences in a red streetcar. The joke is that it's just not convenient at all. It's the same old crappy street card except colored red. <laughs> so there was a lot of jokes like this um, around Spattered. this time where, okay. where it was like, we did a new thing. It's exactly the same as the old thing, except now in a different color. I love it. Yeah. And Redway says it was really ballsy of them to keep the whole censoring committing, censoring committee scene because even when the play became unbanned, most productions still left it out. Interesting. So uh, some, of the, some of it is still relatable, like the term Petrified West or Rotten West is being used by the Russian mainstream news media to this day. Okay. Because there's so, a part where they say, like, you'll have to rewrite that part. Or, for instance, how the new struggle against the old way of life is being waged in the purified West. Or in the petrified West, sorry. So, like, that's something that's still relevant in Russia today. Hmm, okay. Now, when they say the petrified West, I obviously don't know much about Russian slang. Uh -huh. are, is, are they referring to, like, literally the western part of Russia, or are they referring to the west as in the western part of the world? Are they talking about, like, the rest of Europe and America? I don't know. I, I don't actually know what they mean by that. I'm not sure either. Okay. Let uh, us know in the comments. There's also, like, this jazz sequence that was added in just to piss people off because people didn't like jazz. But jazz is great. <laughs> Yeah, but jazz is, like, very free. Like, it's known as, like, more of a working class kind of music, and... But I thought working class was good. All right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, apparently, uh, Mavakovsky really supported jazz because, you know, that's the real music of the oppressed working class. <laughs> So, and then, of course, the whole final segment was kind of like an add-on uh, to the original movie to, like, conclude it because there was there used to be a whole lot more to the movie to make it the two hours long. Mm -hmm. The female characters used to have, like, bigger roles and they actually had, like, a kind of feminist part in it where it's like they were talking about stuff, who knows, but stuff... That's good. And going down more of a roll. I mean, it's still like the 1930s when this original play was written, so it's probably outdated even for 60s standards, but whatever. It's like, it's cool that it was in there at some point. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, and there's also this other little joke um, where Redway pointed out where the walls of this drawer are very obviously the sides of Lennon's Complete Works books, which a lot of people used to own back then. And they said that they guessed that this was a joke how people in charge use the facade of communist ideas to support their luxurious uh, livings. That is interesting. It's like, yeah, it's just like a bunch of books that opens up and it's just his wardrobe. Mm -hmm. Subtle jabs. I like it. Not subtle jabs at all. And another thing, the... Uh, the guy who voiced most of the characters in this film is Art Caddy Ratkin, Rat, Radkin, yet again, so sorry for the name, um, who is an extremely popular stand-up comedian in Russia at the time. Okay. Like, so popular that Redway said that you could show his stuff now and people would still recognize who oh. he was in Russia, kind of super famous. Okay, so hmm, I'm trying to think of like an American comedian of that level. Dick Van Dyke, or like um, was he a comedian on the side? Yeah, yeah, or or like Carol Burnett. Okay. Yeah, probably. I'm trying to think of comedians from the '60s, but I. Carol uh, Burnett. Okay. Like, my mind just immediately blanks because I really don't know that much about even the American 60s. <laughs> something, something, happy days? <laughs> yeah, oh, stop. Anyway. <laughs> so this, this is kind of like a beginning of the start of like comedians being in animated movies. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. Because mm -hmm. Disney's definitely not doing that really. Yeah. Yeah, and, like, in general, I just, I don't feel like I, because I did not grow up in Russia, and I don't know a whole lot of the context of the history of Russia, like, a lot of this doesn't make sense to me, but in a... I know they're doing something here, but I'm not sure what. Right, but because film language is kind of universal, mm -hmm. like, there are things I understand, even if I... Even if I can't explain it in my brain, what's going on, like there's still a lot going on in this film where it's like, I can tell they're making a joke and I laugh, even though I don't get what the joke is. Yeah. You know? And that's just interesting. I think the history of this film is interesting. The history behind its production is, is interesting. About the play it was originally came from is interesting. It's just... It's really fascinating, and this is such an interesting and cool art style. Mm-hmm. I gotta say, this is one of those movies that we had to go back to, mm -hmm. like, when we're doing this episode now. Yeah. We have finished the 60s, and we've gone back because uh, one of our patrons is able to find it for us. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad they found this for us. Yeah. Because... These are the kinds of movies that I'm really excited to watch mm -hmm. and find out more about here on Animation Pilgrimage because they have such a cultural significance and I've literally never heard of them before. Right. Like, this film's a big deal and yet it's, like, not talked about. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to get a hold of. <laughs> it's It's baffling. got a long, complicated history behind it. It's, yeah, it's, it's just really interesting. I don't know. This was enjoyable. Yeah. And again, the art style and like all the visuals, we didn't really talk about them much, but mm -hmm. I enjoyed them. Mm -hmm. I thought the character designs were interesting and fun. I thought the animation was very, I want to say simple, mm -hmm. but, but in a good way. Effective. Yeah, simple but effective. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, uh, nowadays we've seen these like kind of visual jokes a million times but like knowing that this is like the beginnings of this kind of animation style where there's a lot of animations. characters do weird things where their bodies break and slide around their face and stuff yeah like we've seen that a million times but knowing this is like one of the first ones to do it and the fact that it pissed people off so much <laughs> makes it better in my standings. Uh-huh. I love that this movie pissed people off. Like, I, I love that. <laughs> I just think that's great. I love 
like there's a lot of energy behind the motion and like even though this is a pretty old animation at this point a lot of it still stands up pretty well which is not easy to say when it comes to um stop motion films well and there's actually a couple of scenes in here that's obviously puppetry yes like there's some doing puppetry. puppetry to do some like smoke effects and stuff and that's cool i like i like the um the the cross Mm -hmm. The crossing the streams. And I mean, there's also some like smaller segments of traditional animation in here as well. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's a good combination of all the stuff. Yeah. I would definitely check this film out. If you can find it. If you can find it. I don't guarantee that you'll understand it. You might understand it better than Sean and I did. But it's just cool. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Do you have more? Or is I... that it? I think that's it. There's there's honestly, it feels like there's so much to talk about with this movie that you could like really dig deep into mm -hmm. analysis wise. But I just don't think we got time for that here on this show. No. So that's like your brief 101 course on the bath. Now go out and take a bath. Take a bath and do research and find out more and let me know in the comments. <laughs> But anyway, next time on Animation Pilgrimage, we'll be covering... Doggy March. Doggy March. 1963. By... I'm pretty sure it's Toei Animation. Yeah. Definitely Japan. Yeah. See, See you guys then. then.